there are a handful of very successful entrepreneurs who have come from a professional cycling background. And we all know that basically we're going to go anywhere in life and you're never going to have that kind of pressure. All you know as a cyclist, you know that if you put your head down and grind, you're going to succeed. And that's the truth here at, at Untapped also. You know, we certainly find more results the harder we work. And it's been an awesome transition. Welcome to The Common Threads. During each episode, we'll travel through time to explore the childhoods, influences, and habits of the people behind some of the world's leading companies, movements, and ideas. Subscribe today on Apple Podcasts or your favorite listening app, or check us out at commonthreadsmedia.com. I'm your host, David Swain. Today we're talking with Ted King. Ted made his mark as one of the top U.S. pro cyclists. He rode in some of the world's biggest races, pulling for the likes of Peter Sagan, who, if you don't follow cycling, is one of the legends of the sport. Ted officially retired from the pro tours in 2015 and is now an ambassador for the sport of cycling, but he still tears it up on the race course when he chooses to. We'll talk about what it looks like to reach the top levels of a sport, but I also wanted to get into entrepreneurship and what he's up to in the hills of Vermont, cranking away as co-founder of Untapped, the maple syrup powered food for athletes. Let's get into it. Ted King, what'd you have for breakfast this morning? I grabbed a banana, I went for a 90 minute ride, and then I rode to the bakery and got a muffin and a coffee. What'd you have? I had two eggs and a piece of toast and a cup of coffee. Solid. Uh, how do you do your eggs? Over medium. What about you? You know what's really good? If you put an egg in oatmeal and you stir that up either through the process if you're doing it on the stove or every, say, minute if you're doing it in the microwave, it gives your oatmeal a wonderfully custardy texture. I'm a big fan of that. And then if I go pure eggs, I'll just fry one and chuck some cheese on it. All right. Let's talk about you as a kid. What were you doing summer, 8 and 10 years old? Um, I mentioned this amazing island off the coast of Maine where I am the sixth generation for my family to go there. It's a small island. It's about three miles off the coast. It's about four miles in circumference. There's about 100 cottages. It's one of these places that's Everybody knows everybody. So it's a great place for a kid to be a kid, learn how to stub their toe, kiss a girl, grow up, and it's just, it's heaven on earth. At that age of these eight and 10 year olds, I was doing that from the day school would get out until the day school would start back up again. On the athletic side, I, from the time I could stand, I could skate. Hockey was a huge sport. So for a good portion of my childhood, I thought I'd be a professional hockey player. And how long did you play hockey? I played right up until I was, I believe, 17. I played through junior year of high school. I also skied quite a bit, and this hockey coach was not happy that I was at risk threatening my life and limbs by being on the ski slopes. He was especially upset, maybe coincidentally, when I broke my arm. So at that point, I decided I liked skiing more than hockey, so I stopped at age 17. All right, so you're, you're an eight-year-old, spending your summers in Maine, playing hockey. Not too many years later, you become a pro cyclist. And thinking back to you as a kid, you know, how competitive were you? I would consider myself a pretty type A kid. I like to do well in school. I like to do well at sports. I was verbose. I was outgoing. I mean, I think that allowed me to pick up cycling relatively late in the game. I mean, I, I didn't just play hockey. I played all sorts of sports. I played sports year-round. Uh, goalie for the soccer team, played captain of the tennis team, played, you know, every other sport in between growing up to figure out what I really loved. And, yeah, hockey took a great deal of time. It was actually as a result of hockey. So I went to Middlebury College here in Vermont, and I, I considered trying to walk onto the team, which I know sounds kind of silly having taken senior year off, but, you know, they have a great hockey team at Middlebury. They're, they're perennial D3 national champions. And I wanted to get back into it. I was playing intramural, and I had some other friends attempting to, to walk on. And, and it was also around the same time that my brother, my older brother, was at Colorado College. And he came east to Vermont to race the Collegiate National Championships hosted by the University of Vermont, which was just, you know, 30 minutes up the road from where I was going to school. I went and watched this race. I didn't really care about the race. I watched the halfway point where it was his feed zone personnel. I gave him a water bottle. I said, eh, it's kind of boring. I went back to school. 
Robbie went on to win that race, the first of his three collegiate national titles. As anyone who's into collegiate cycling or cycling in general in America knows, a national title is incredibly hard to get. He won that. It was around the same time. I was like, ah, oh, man, I could do this hockey thing, or I could probably be the beneficiary of some hand-me-down bikes. I probably have these genetics. Maybe I'll get into cycling. So, yeah, it wasn't really until college that I got into cycling full bore. And what about your parents with sports growing up? Was there pressure? Like we were, you know, before the show, we were talking about raising athletes <laughs> and what's going on with the kids' yeah. world of sports these days. Uh, yeah, no pressure whatsoever. I mean, my parents incredibly supportive from the time I could stand in athletics through the present. Um, you know, they're very proud parents of the athletic endeavors my brother and I would do. Yeah, shoot. Supporting kids who want to get into hockey and, and skiing, those are the two most ridiculous sports you could. Like, hockey tournaments at 6 a.m. on the other side of the state. Like, yeah, I have a great deal of gratitude for them. But they weren't, they never force-fed us. They let us pick the sports we wanted to do, and it worked out tremendously well. They were huge supporters, but not so much influencers. So walk me through, like, for all the people who dream of becoming a pro athlete or who have tried to become, you know, really good at a sport that requires the endurance that cycling does. So you get started freshman year in college. Mm -hmm. You've got some inkling from watching your brother that you might have that <laughs> mm -hmm. some of those and some of that endurance and and how fast did you pick it up like when how quickly were you able to see the potential that you could have so the year is what 2001 i started school and it was spring of 2002 that i was getting into cycling and what we see now in cycling is a very welcoming sport it's you know the advent of gravel and all these just sort of the communal nature of cycling now it was a different era and generation then where, yeah, it was all greatly about racing. It was about chasing points and moving up in the categories. And and especially if you have an older brother, as younger brothers often do, they're chasing their older brothers around. So he was already great, and I was aspiring to chase his footprints. You know, I, I describe my development in cycling as very organic. I never had aspirations to go to the pro tour, ever. Every step of the way was an organic unfolding. So, you know, there I am racing as a Cat 5, as a as a 18-year-old, or I guess 19. And I got into collegiate racing. I'd been picking up some of his training plans, and I remember going to the first collegiate race, and I knew that I wanted to go to the collegiate national championships because that was my first influence, Robbie's race. And I'm on the start line in my first race, and I say, okay, I'm racing the Bs, and someone's like, you can't go to the collegiate B national championship. So I'm like, oh shoot, yeah, no, I want to race A's. And on the start line, I raced A's and I did pretty well. And th that is a microcosm for everything. Like I then went to the amateur scene and I started doing races then. And no, I didn't walk away just absolutely crushing the field, but I just had a lot of success. And I saw that it's such a sport that rewards time in, you know, time in is results out. So I trained my tail off. That actually meant the end of my time at Squirrel Island or very limited time at Squirrel Island because it's foot traffic only, really, really small place with, you know, no bikes allowed because it's so small. So success in the amateur scene, success in the collegiate scene. I got invited to the under-23 national team over in Belgium. So I live under the roof of a very European influence. How far operation. after you started was that? Uh, I was 22, so two and a half years in. Yeah. That program is a USA Cycling, so our governing federation that's their funded project to give americans and uh, european influence and experience that has changed a lot in its 15 years since that time and I'm, I'm sure it was much different prior to that so continue that you know then i go domestic pro i raced that three years never had aspirations to make it to europe but i had a great third year and that caught the attention of the europeans and went to a european team and made that into a seven-year career so yeah very serendipitous with a heck of a lot of hard work in between so you're in school, you're racing bikes that, like you said, requires a lot of time and focus. How do you, what were the trade-offs that you've had to make? Um, there were funny trade-offs through college. So, you know, fast forward a few years, we're in the heart of Vermont where the training is not the easiest in those base mile months. So I, one semester, withdrew from Middlebury and went to the University of Arizona for, that was my semester abroad, I, I joke, which was an incredible experience in Tucson, Arizona, so far as the United States is concerned, is about as different as, as northern Vermont as it gets. So that was an awesome experience. I had a great deal of support. I never there was only one time I had one political science professor who was like, What are you doing? Like, what's the likelihood of success? And, you know, I sort of put my head down and just 
I didn't set out to prove him wrong, but I I remember that vividly, and I was highly entertained by it because I'm like, yo, we're still kids. I mean, I'm a 21 year old at that point. Um, fast forward to Europe, there are a lot of trade offs. In order to succeed, you live in Europe for 10 plus months of the year, and and so it's a lot of at that age in life, mid late 20s, early 30s. It's a lot of weddings, it's a lot of holidays, it's a lot of birthdays missed, friends having their kids. So that was a trade-off. It was a bummer, but I always made it absolutely certain to be back for holidays on uh, the cold weather months and see family, and it's all worthwhile. Talking about like life as a pro being in Europe, and you know, one of the things that I've been really interested in and impressed with what you've done for cycling as a sport with your pot. You've got your podcast now, King of the Ride, and you're super involved in the event scene and getting people out. Talk about your the cycling community as a pro versus now what you're doing back here mm-hmm. and uh, kind of nurturing kind of all aspects of the cycling world. So let's dabble in social media just for a minute. I went to a small liberal arts school in New England in the early 2000s. Like I am a Mark Zuckerberg era student. So Facebook came to my school very early. Like I remember when my parents were on Facebook, that was mind boggling to me. Or somebody in high school was on Facebook. I'm like, no, this thing is meant for college people. And then like, oh, I see what he's doing here. This is a much bigger network. Quite frankly, his market is everybody on planet earth. But for a long time, that was, it seemed weird. So I was early on Facebook because that's what we did in college. I was early adopter of Twitter, early adopter of Strava, um, being here geographically here in New England. You know, it's a New Hampshire based company originally. So I was using these platforms as a way to stay entertained. Uh, I had a blog for relatively early on. I am Ted I mean, I started that my first year raising pro 2006. And so having all of these tools at the right time allowed me to stay involved. And it, it was most certainly a way to communicate. You know, if I'm living overseas, it's it can be lonesome plenty of times, and it's easier to write one blog that covers a lot of people as opposed to writing 25 different emails to all my friends and family back home. And I think the same goes for the social media, the Stravas, the Twitters, the Facebooks. At that time, it was a way to, to communicate. So, yeah, racing in Europe is an entirely different sport than in America. It's a bigger playing field. The sport is faster, harder, longer. I, I often compare it to soccer. So here in America, we have MLS, Major League Soccer. In Europe, that's the big leagues, and that's where you really want to go. And cycling has, at that point, it was called the NRC, National Racing Circuit. It probably has some other abbreviation at this point. But there is great American racing at the end of the day. If you really want to be on the next playing field, that's over in Europe. You end up in a community. So I I moved to Girona, Spain. That's that's just sort of Mecca for cyclists from all over the world. Primarily, Anglo-Saxons come into Europe to base their careers, so a lot of Brits and Aussies and Kiwis, and but then a lot of continental Europeans too, who are just need better weather than northern Belgium. So, tremendous community there. Uh, I raced for an Italian team for a handful of years, so I actually moved to Lucca, Italy, and honed my Italian. Lucca is sort of a smaller Girona in that a lot of cyclists call home in Lucca. You know, at the end of the day, I I like having a community. It was it's important to be able to decompress after a race and either talk about the race or talk about all things outside of bike racing segueing out of my my bike racing career so I raced professionally for 10 years and it was early in 2015 that I knew I knew I was about done I was 32 years old uh, I'd raced for 10 years I had a college degree but by no means does that guarantee you anything I studied econ and math and and I was like you know what I've had a blast doing this being a domestique your job is to fulfill somebody else's win and go work for that other person's win. And most certainly when that person wins, that is a team win. So especially having worked for Peter Sagan for four years, he is unequivocally our generation's best cyclist. Like we won a ton of races and I was part of those races and I raced a ton of races with him, which was an honor and a privilege and something that I'll always have. That final year, 2015, I'm like, I was no longer teammates with him. We had switched to separate teams. I'm like what else, what am I aspiring to here? And I sort of like lacked that big time fire. So I decided at that point that early on in 2015, that that would be the end of my racing career. And it was with the asterisk in the middle of that year to that, uh, it was about May, June. I thought I was going to, you know, be stepping into wall street or, or trying to do all sorts of other things that were much more related to the degree. A lot of sponsors stepped forward and said, Hey, we want to, we want to keep you in the sport. We like your voice. We like you represent. Would you like to ride on behalf of our, 
brand. And, you know, at that point, athlete ambassadorship in cycling, I think, was still relatively new. So it wasn't something I anticipated at all. And I still love riding a bike. Absolutely love it. And the timing is right and ripe for the community of cycling and the gravel scene. And it's just been a really timely departure from pro tour racing. Talk about gravel. This is just a specific thing. But, you know, I got into cycle cross for fun, which got me into gravel, which opened up my eyes to the part of cycling that I really love, which is just being outside and doing it with friends. You know, 10 years from now, like you're looking at where cycling's going and there does seem like there's been a transition from, like you said, from just racing to more of a communal side of sports. I've seen that in running as well. Where does it go? Are we going to be seeing big gravel races taking the place of the <laughs> it's a it's a really good question i think a lot of people are trying to get an answer to that i've talked about this quite a bit in my podcast precisely the question what is the direction of gravel and we see a lot of traits in gravel cycling now to mountain biking 15 years ago in its advent in its sort of franken bike heyday where it didn't matter what bike you showed up on as long as you guys were out and having a good time together or gals absolutely i mean just a very very welcoming sport and then Mountain bike racing took precedence and all of a sudden people were making the lightest bikes and you know, they turned out to be a bit flimsy and it became too racy in so many words and mountain biking lost its luster and you know probably a thousand other factors at play. Basically the question is a lot of people who have that perspective, how do we keep gravel cycling cool? And this all said, nothing is fluid about cycling. So mountain biking is as freaking cool as it gets right now in the overall umbrella of cycling. So they've fell on a nadir and now they're cruising up on an absolute wave in mountain biking. We want to sort of skip that, that low point in gravel and keep it cool. There are gravel races. There are huge gravel races. Right. There are 2,000 plus person gravel races. And those are awesome. I did Dirty Kansas this year. I've done it the past three years. It's awesome. There's 2,700 people who show up. There's 2,700 people who are psyched. Tons of other gravel events here in Vermont. We have Vermont Overland. We have Rasputitsa. These are bringing 400, 500, 800,000 people out. It's interesting because there's such a, it is welcoming, and one thing that's awesome about gravel is you quickly find your tribe, even if you're going into a race. Chances are, if you're going to finish in the 50th percentile, you your goal is not to show up and be on the podium. Like, you will quickly find your people, your people with a similar biking ability or physiological ability so that, yeah, if you're finishing this ride in five hours, you're probably meant to do the ride in about five hours. If you finish in three hours, you're probably supposed to be doing it in about three hours. As compared to on road racing, if you go into a road race and you hit the first climb and you're spat out the back, like that's the end of your day. You may as well go home. You you are not going to be part of the race for the next three hours. Like there there is no longer a peloton, whereas gravel still has that community as a result of being such a big starting field. There are some small nerdy nuances to it like should we have aero bars should team tactics be part of gravel racing i certainly frown on these because i'm a huge proponent of the communal aspect while still keeping it competitive so you know i don't have the answer but it's interesting to see this progression of gravel that we're absolutely right in the middle of what about on training like nutrition and of mental health as fun as it is being on a pro tour for 10 months like keeping your brain in a good place has got to be like almost as not as important, but probably up there, right? With keeping your, your legs on and your body functioning. Like, how do you think about those things? What have you kind of taken away as learnings? Oh my goodness. I've written some blogs about how it's mandatory to be jack of all trades. Like you are a professional nutritionist, dietitian, physio, you know how to take right. care of your body, your professional EMT as you are changing your own dressing after returning home from a race. Uh, you have a minor in accounting as you're transitioning a few different currencies. So that is certainly one hand. Yeah, you are being a professional cyclist means you are a professional at many trades. There is a ton of downtime on the pro tour. There's a ton of time you are twiddling your thumbs and looking at the internet. And you're bored out of your mind. So, you know, if you read the favorite activities of a lot of cyclists, it's reading, it's cooking. And for you know, myself included, it's because those are ways to occupy your time. And as a semi-professional nutritionist, like it's good to be aware of the food you're fueling with. I really enjoy writing. I am Ted King.com. 
it was never tedious. It was fun to be out on training rides and at races and thinking of the things that I was going to be telling. So that is what the website became known as, is a, is a median to sort of tell the world what Joe Schmo, Ted King, does on a, in a bike ride, on a bike race, on the Pro Tour. It's easier said than done. I know a lot of people who are told, hey, start a blog, start a blog, start a blog. And until you do it and do it regularly, you know, it's not going to go anywhere. Yeah, plenty of ways to stay busy. Yeah. Plenty of ways to be bored. And it's just a question of which one you're going to do. I feel like you had some pretty good lessons in there on the communal side of things to maintain and cycling as different parts of the sport kind of take off. But similar on the training and nutrition side, for all the people who want to be <laughs> performing just to their potential, you know, there's like all the talk and hype where it's clearly hype and it doesn't work versus things where you that you found that it works for you. And, you know, we're sitting here about a couple hundred yards from the place where you and your co-founders found it untapped. So maybe that can be part of this conversation as well, how that fits into. They are intrinsically tied. So yeah, there are a lot of fads. There are a lot of fast solutions. There's a lot of goofy answers for ways to be at your best, but I think there's a lot to be said about simplicity. So it was great being on an Italian team in a lot of ways, although they would also deprive you of food at you know, certain times of the year. But if you go and are training in Italy and, and you get a great pasta at night, there's very few ingredients on your plate. You have exquisite pasta with great olive oil, a little bit of cheese and salt, and that's it. You know, you crack open a can of SpaghettiOs and you're going to have 75 different ingredients on your plate. So this was also the sort of the advent of Dr. Alan Lim bringing his methodology and his thinking into cycling sports nutrition as well, where it is all about real foods. It's about keeping it simple. So amid my racing and being known as a New Englander, I would often step off the bus at a bike race and very, very generous fans would hand me quarts, pints, half gallons of maple syrup. And I think, you know, for one, they've trekked this all the way across the globe. It's expensive. It's not like giving me a high five and a, and a selfie. So these people have very generously given me this gift and I would, you know, graciously go home and put it on my oatmeal and put it on my pancakes. And every once in a while I'd start putting it in my water bottle or I'd come back from a ride and like, it's liquid gold. I'd be so psyched to have a spoonful of it or, you know, take a small slug or syrup from the bottle. After consuming so many gels, way too many gels in my career, you put it together that at the end of the day, a gel is a whole bunch of carbohydrates and maple syrup is a whole bunch of carbohydrates. And then a tertiary search of maple syrup sports nutrition, you realize that maple syrup is loaded with amino acids, electrolytes, antioxidants. It's very easy for your body to digest. It is sucrose, so it breaks down your body as glucose and fructose, which is a huge benefit in endurance sports. So I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm sitting on a land mine, a gold mine here. Why has nobody ever put maple syrup into an individual gel? So I would come back to North America in the off season. I would ride to farmer's markets. I would pull out a generic maple syrup pack and I'd talk to the farmer at the farmer's market and I'd say, I want to put your maple syrup into this packet and no one ever understood it or they are purely focused on selling bottles of maple syrup so they didn't want to be on board. After about two years of that where it wasn't going anywhere, I met my current partner at Untapped, Andrew Gardner, and he said, light bulb moment, you got to talk to the Cochran's. Now the Cochran's own this beautiful property that we're sitting on right now, which is a small ski area in Vermont. And they have generated three generation of Olympic Alpine skiers here in Vermont. The four cousins my age started a maple syrup operation about six years prior. So they are athletes making maple syrup, sure, for grocery, for restaurants, for bulk maple syrup, but they also understood the power and, and efficacy of maple syrup. So they also had the bandwidth to be figuring out how to put it into packages, how to figure out all the insurance, all the distribution, all the those requirements that I couldn't do while living and racing overseas. Bada boom, bada bing. <laughs> that is the really long story of Untapped, which is now, it's a whole sports nutrition lineup, and that's a great deal of what I'm doing now. We have two packets. One is pure organic maple syrup. One is organic maple syrup infused with coffee, so you get a natural caffeine boost. We have three waffles, maple, raspberry, and coffee, all of which taste like those three things because we only use those real things. We forbid natural flavors in our products, so we use real raspberries. We use real coffee. We use real maple syrup. And very excited about two new drink mixes that just came out. Same concept. One is super simple with three ingredients. One has just four. So how many years has it been going from the start of just your maple syrup? 
we started with a successful 2014 crowdfunding campaign. Whilst I was racing the Tour de France, I figured, we all figured, hey, what better platform than the Tour de France to be racing and see what kind of uh, momentum we can get from a worldly audience. And we smashed through our goal and then been cruising since then. Huh. I was thinking before our chat about the likely similarities between entrepreneurship and, you know, you've got the domestique and the sprinter and the climber and the person that's out in front that you're, everyone's pulling for. And it can be lonely at times, probably like being a pro athlete out for months of the year. Talk about that, the transition into the business world. And um, one of the awesome aspects of our company is that we have remained really small and everybody immediately had a role that we were able to fulfill really well. So I continued to race, but I had a platform upon which to tell people about not only our crowdfunding campaign, but then the product itself and where to buy it and explain to a big audience that I was lucky to have to bring it full circle as a result of being a early adopter to Twitter, to Instagram, to Facebook, to have that audience, to speak to them. My partners, the Cochrans, for them already having had the slope side operation, they were able to, you know, figure out the distribution, all these things that we had just talked about a second ago. Andrew Gardner, he has a PR firm, so his role is to get us into PR and, and mm. you know, get us in the right publications, magazines. So we, we remain a really small company. We haven't had to outsource much like a bike team, we have, everybody has a role. And as long as we're doing our job and doing a job well, it's been a blast. There are certain pressures in bike racing. I mean, the worst case scenario effectively is you're racing in Northern Belgium. You're on a road about eight feet wide. You've got Peter Sagan, the world's best cyclist on your wheel. You're supposed to deliver him to a particular point in the race. It's windy. It is pouring rain. It's probably sleeting a little bit. And there's, you know, cow shit coming up in your face. <laughs> And there's somebody screaming at you in a foreign language because you're on, you know, an Italian cycling team. That, to me, is a level of pressure that I know it's bike racing, I know it's sports, but that level of pressure is something that we share in the peloton. And we all know that basically we're going to go anywhere in life and you're never going to have that kind of pressure. There are a handful of very successful entrepreneurs who have come from a professional cycling background. You know, it's that time in, results out. That's all you know as a cyclist. You know that if you put your head down and grind, you're going to succeed. And that's the truth here at, at Untapped also. You know, we certainly find more results the harder we work. And it's been an awesome transition. Hmm. You know, I was really interested in you starting as your cycling career as a freshman in college and, you know, watching the pressure that's on really young kids these days to, like, pick one sport to focus on by the age of, eight or nine or 10 or 11, by the time they get to high school or college, they're in all likelihoods burnt out, or maybe their parents chose the wrong sport. <laughs> so what's your message to parents who want the best for their kids, but what have you seen through the your peers in the sport that have come up? I was going to say put them on a bike because the bike's the greatest thing ever. <laughs> um, but no, I've I've seen a lot of Having gotten into the sport later, I think I was able to succeed and not be burned out at a younger age. Um, yeah, getting into it at 19, 20, yeah, I would see a lot of people who had been racing since they were 12 years old and they were already finished. Surrounded by or overlooking these kids, you know, 100 yards away, that level of cycling is awesome. And what Leah and Saber Davison have done, we just saw Saber on her walk over here a second ago, what they've done with Little Bellas, getting... Girls, I want to say about 15 years or younger, onto bikes. I think that is awesome, and that is everything that's right about bicycles. I don't want to give parenting advice, and I certainly won't do it. I think it's awesome when a parent can share a sport with a kid, whether it's skiing or hockey or just playing catch with your kid or most certainly going for a bike ride. Those are all awesome. Yeah, you just you don't want to shove it down the kid's throat. You want them to embrace it and enjoy it, and not every day is going to be... <laughs> Sunshine and buttercups. So, yeah, I think there's a lot to be said about pushing a kid through some bad days, but I don't know. I grew up doing every sport under the sun. As I mentioned, I love the bicycle because it is a lifetime sport. I grew up riding a bike quite a bit, but it was purely to get to the local convenience store, to buy candy and soda with my friends, to ride to my friend's house, to ride to school. I think, I think that's awesome. And it's the same thing that I do now at this age, riding my bike to a coffee shop and riding with friends to drink caffeine rather than soda. I suppose they're one and the same, but, you know, drink coffee instead of Coke. And what about uh, coaches, trainers, 
mentors, people who have kind of helped you along through your career? Without question, my brother has been the coolest influence on me, you know, without question. I would not be a cyclist without him. He got into it in high school. I followed in his footsteps, getting into it a little bit later. We don't get out and ride often anymore. He's pursuing medical school now, but when we do, we still have a blast, which is awesome. I have had a handful of coaches, and I think those are all very valuable. I maintain really good relationships with them. Most certainly, people will hit me up for for advice all the time, and I'll often say, get a coach, because as you know, I mean, it's very acute very quickly. I can give you a thousand individual bits of training advice, but the reality is like, if you really want to improve, then, then having a coach is a huge benefit. Side note, I have a small coaching business. Uh, I coach about half dozen athletes, which as we were walking over here, we were discussing that, you know, I, I, I have all these things on social media that I like to share because quite frankly, I, I gleaned a lot of insight and knowledge over a 10 year career and I want to share that. So no different in the, in the realm of coaching. Yeah, tremendous support from my parents. They were just, you know, on the sideline cheering. Never force-fed anything, just really great supporters, and they get that. So on the coaching side and what you've been doing with the handful of athletes that you're you're helping out, what's that look like? Like, for people who haven't had a coach, are you seeing these people in person, or is it more giving them tips, looking mm-hmm. over their activities and helping them think through? Yeah, it's more the latter. I mean, with the everything online these days, yeah. they can upload their training file. I can see geographically with, you know, the geotagging of it. I can see where they're riding. I can see what hills they're climbing. I can see the gradients. I can see their power outputs, their heart rates, their speed, their cadence, and coach them on all those things. Generally throughout the year, I see each of these six to eight athletes once or twice a year, which, yeah, you can do a heck of a lot of training in person that you can't do over a computer screen. So a little of everything in the events that I do with my with the various sponsors that I'm involved with, I get to do a lot of events and camps and product launches. And as a result, I'm, I'm with people who ride a bike who are not folks that I coach all the time. And I try tastefully to give them advice. I mean, it, it's much like telling your spouse how to drive. You don't want to do it because you realize <laughs> you're going to see some ramifications. And it's it's not easy to tell this person next to you with whom you're sharing this recreating activity, like, hey, you're doing it wrong. Let me tell you how to do it. So you tastefully figure out ways to tell this person how to slow their cadence, stand up less, stand up more, increase their cadence, stop half-wheeling me, point stuff out. There are plenty of really adept cyclists who have skill but no physiology. There's plenty of people who have huge physiology, huge engines, but don't know what to do with it. They're like a toddler behind the wheel of a Ducati or handlebars of a Ducati. So, you know... Again, in this communal era of cycling, we're trying to just smooth everything out so that the fast guy can ride with a slow guy. Let everybody just sort of ride in harmony. And what about women's cycling? I heard you uh, on one of your podcasts this year, they put the women's race in the middle of the week, in the one day. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> where's that going? Where's, you know, positive signs or rooms for improvement? Sure. I mean, cycling in general, professional cycling is the biggest amateur sport on the planet. And that's on the men's side. Domestic cycling is often in shambles. Women's cycling has nothing but improvement that can be made. Again, it goes back to the fluid nature of what cycling is in general. And there's, you know, this is going to be uh, what we see this year, this month, today is different than what we're going to see next year or 10 years or five years down the road. So, yeah, I mean, I thought it was curious that the men's Tour de France was run at the same time as the women's Giro d'Italia. Initially, I was skeptical of it, but it turned into an incredible race. And I think as a result of cycling fans in general paying attention to the men's side, they were also paying attention to the women's side. Mm. Directly after the Giro, a day or two later, they had a women's one-day Tour de France uh, that was held on a Tuesday. I mean, typically 99.9% of the time, one-day bike races are held on weekends. And so I thought it was a really curious decision to do it on a Tuesday. It happened to be during the Tour de France, and it happened to produce a really fascinating race. So is anything perfect? No. The development is there. I think it's it's often two steps forward, one step back. You know, these teams will come along and have great rosters and great budgets, and then uh, they'll exist for two years, and then they'll be done. And that exemplary team is gone. But then another year or two later, another example like that will come to the fore, and it's great progress followed up by some unfortunate fallbacks. But by and large, I think the sport of cycling, female cycling, domestic cycling, is going in the right direction. 
Give everybody the 60 seconds on the Dirty Kanza. <laughs> okay. So Dirty Kanza is now in its 11th year. This is a 206-mile race across Kansas. It is a figure-eight loop. And what started with 38 people 11 years ago is now 2,700. Um, I had heard of it in the growth of gravel throughout my career, my, my bike racing career, but it was prohibitive to do it as I'm racing overseas. So in 2016, my first year retired, I Rebecca Rush said, hey, you got to come do this crazy race in Kansas. And I did. And I went in completely naive. I knew how to ride on cobbles. I knew how to ride long distances. I came away with some success. I won the race. The next year I went back and I thought that I was just going to clean up again. The field got deeper. I had some bad luck and I did not win. So then 2018, I went back again. The field was as deep as it's ever been. Lots of professional cyclists amid this 2,700 person field. And I came away the victor. And I was pretty psyched about that because, yeah, it's a I have totally different motivations and goals and, and methods in which I pursue these goals. So now in retirement to be doing these gravel races is one heck of a lot of fun. It's everything that's right about bike racing and bike riding. I definitely wholeheartedly suggest people go out to these gravel events, be it Dirty Kansas or the one down yeah. the road from you. Is it funny to say the word retirement and winning the Dirty Kansas in the same? <laughs> Most definitely. You know? Yeah. Again, I have totally different motivations and levels of discipline. I mean, to be a professional bike racer, you're perpetually starved. You don't drink alcohol for long periods of time or at all. You are training six days a week. Yeah. And now I drink a lot of beer. I eat a lot of food. I ride my bike hard and often in a completely otherly level of discipline. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. I saw on Strava, your goal for the year is 15,000 miles. Is that that's, about what you ride in a year? That is a Strava estimate based on last oh, year okay. that then was prompted me to say, is that your goal? And <laughs> rather than leaving it blank, I just hit confirm. Although it's funny how close I am. Yeah. Um, I was leading it for a while and then I was, I just got some end of the month report from Strava and I was comparing it with my wife. And I said the past three months amid this drive and move across the country and all these life changes, I'm on a three month downward trend of, of distance and miles and everything traveled. So I think in the past short window i've fallen behind my projected distance all right so we're gonna do some fast questions all right all right what's in your garage that you can't live without is my bike too easy even answer? no like what yeah what's your your bike or your piece of gear that is just kind of your okay i know you said fast i'm gonna be as quick as i can yeah we just bought a house so currently my garage <laughs> is empty because we're in a rental it has 10 acres of property, and the thing that I'm most excited about is the lawnmower that I don't yet own. Oh, that's good. I could say bike, but I own, I think, nine bikes, so I don't have one you single have quiver favorite, bicycle. But, yeah. uh, if it says Cannondale, it's probably... Okay. And you've been riding Cannondale fate. since your first bike? It was my first, racing. first yeah. ever road bike, first ever mountain bike, first ever cross bike. That was all complete coincidence, and then I started racing them professionally in 2011, and I have since. That's awesome. What's your go-to food um i love all food well okay sorry from 100 <laughs> yards away i see four cool mountain bikers in their cool clothes who are about to go mountain biking and they're sharing a beer <laughs> don't worry audience they are also many hundred yards away from the kids who are wrapping up their trip and about to go home i love ipa moving back to vermont ipa is like it's so good that rivals maple syrup around here uh all maple products anything sweet and then I love healthy food too. I like, had the original question been, what is my go-to tool? I would have said the Cuisinart and I like making my own hummus and yeah. there's nothing better than like happy hour with hummus and carrots and cheese and crackers. There we go. And beer. I'm going to have that this afternoon. So phone, apps you can't live without or that are, or that you're just interesting to you right now. Um, I am a slave to the apps. I do Instagram quite a bit, Strava quite a bit. I like the simplicity of tethering my, my Garmin to, so the Garmin Connect will send it to Strava. I think that's wonderful. And there was once upon a time that I thought texting was the stupidest thing ever. And I mean, in a way, that's an app. Yeah. And lo and behold, my brother told me the other day that he sent like 140,000 texts last year. It's <laughs> insane. That's a lot of conversation. And I probably do twice that. Podcasts, you've gotten into into your own what 
King of the Ride is definitely one of my faves. That is mine. <laughs> so I listen to it to make sure it's it's functional. Um, Freakonomics, yeah. stuff you should know. If I just flip on the radio, I like all things NPR, but then they'll often be in the middle of the show, so then I'll you know Bluetooth it to This American Life or get the full story there. How I Built This is excellent. Yeah. I'm just waiting for them to call me up. Like, Guy Ted, Ross. Ted, we want, we want to talk to you about Untapped. <laughs> Right or how I how you built that how I yeah. built that, we're waiting we're holding out good for, for how that. I built this right it's kind of perfect yeah. All right, east versus west. <laughs> we moved a better part of a month ago. I love California. I love the Rockies. I realize those are two different things. I love I love the United States and the ability to travel, which I've been blessed enough to do. I haven't really felt a need to leave New England for an instant. Winter's coming though, so. We'll see. I'll check in on that one. Yeah. All right, gravel versus road. Ooh. Time being gravel. I mean, Vermont, we're in God's country for gravel right now. The gravel is so smooth, so buffed out. You can easily ride your road bike on it, but then with your gravel bike, you can... I rode back the other day and then rode some single track on my way back. So, gravel. All right. Strength versus agility. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, agility. All right, what do you do for agility? I don't know. Uh, I mean, I'm tall. I I I'm a cyclist. Go, I'm big guy. <laughs> so, I'm I'm yeah. just shy of six three, so I'm not one of these like five foot nothing cyclists who are have enormous power to weight ratios. Yeah. I mean, I think I'd rather be brainy than brawny. So let's figure right, out recovery, a way. sleep versus nutrition. I was just talking about this the other day. Um. Nutrition. I mean, if I, in the acute example, if I'm going to finish yeah. a ride, I'm going to get the proper recovery food as opposed to being like, I need to take a nap. I'll throw a third one in there and say massage is utterly important, yeah. although it's not something I do terribly often. Night before a race, what do you eat? Whatever I want. Two days before a race, same? Same. <laughs> That's good. All right, last one. What's the most important thing that you've taken away from cycling? Well, I mean, not to get too corny, it's sort of brought me everything. It's brought me a life and profession and my friends and my wife and my life and backtracked half yeah. hour. I never expected it. I got into bike riding and racing because it was fun. I enjoy the competition. It's blown me away what it's provided me in the past 15 plus years. Untapped in two years. Whew. Taking over the world. Uh, it would be great to see it in every Bike shop, ski shop, run shop, coffee shop, outdoor shop, pharmacy, grocery store. And I mean, I think that's the beauty of it is it is real food. So, you know, parents can feel comfortable giving it to their kid as a snack at soccer practice. It's great for camping. It's great for hiking. It's freaking delicious. I've seen people put it on their chain. True story. Water soluble. <laughs> if you got a loud chain, put some maple syrup on it. All right. Ted King, thank you. This was fun. Sitting in Vermont, the rain is about to start falling. Afternoon shower. Yeah, buddy. David Swain, I appreciate it. This has been a lovely conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to our show this week. If you want to find out more or give us your feedback, go to commonthreadsmedia.com or leave us a comment on Instagram or Facebook. You can subscribe to our podcast at Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Thanks to Alicia Barrett, who edited the show. You've been listening to The Common Threads from Common Threads Media.